Well, hey guys, and welcome back for a little more uh, reading and reflection. It's March, and uh, we're going to continue on here with our uh, monthly reading and reflection activity. This is one of the few months where we read from a Sand County Almanac, and we're not reading from the actual month from which it was written. We're actually reading a short story from the month of November called Axe in Hand, but this is too good uh, not to look at in our Trees in the Main Forest class, so we I usually save this one uh, for March. So we're going to read this story together here today, and then you're going to, you're going to complete a Collins Type 3 um, reflection for me, you know, three to five sentences, um, and I'll uh, we'll, we'll elaborate on that a little more later. But for now, let's jump in and read our story here, and we may stop and discuss things uh, as we go as well. So uh, Leopold writes, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but he is no longer the only one to do so. When some remote ancestor of ours invented the shovel, he became a giver. He could plant a tree. And when the axe has, was invented, he became a taker. He could chop it down. Whoever owns land has thus assumed, whether he knows it or not, the divine functions of creating and destroying plants. Leopold's talking about playing God here, right? Choosing which plants to leave and which to, uh, which to take on his property. Other ancestors, less remote, have since invented other tools, but each of these, upon close scrutiny, proves to be either an elaboration of or an accessory to the original pair of basic implements. We classify ourselves into vocations, each of which either wields some particular tool or sells it or repairs it or sharpens it or dispenses advice on how to, how, on how to do so. By such division of labors, we avoid responsibility for the misuse of any tool, save our own. But there is one vocation, philosophy, which knows that all men, by what they think about and wish for, in effect, wield all tools. It knows that men thus determine by their manner of thinking and wishing whether it is worthwhile to wield any. November is, for many reasons, the month for the axe. It is warm enough to grind an axe without freezing, but cold enough to fell a tree in comfort. The leaves are off the hardwoods so that one can see just how the branches intertwine and what growth occurred last summer. Without this clear view of treetops, one cannot be sure which tree, if any, needs felling for the good of the land. I have read many definitions of what is a conservationist and written not a few myself, but I suspect that the best one is written not with a pen, but with an axe. It is a matter of what a man thinks about while chopping or while deciding what to chop. A conservationist is one who is humbly aware that what with each stroke he is writing his signature on the face of his land. Signatures, of course, differ, whether written with an axe or pen, and this is as it should be. I find it disconcerting to analyze ex post facto the reasons behind my own axe and hand decisions. I find, first of all, that not all trees are created free and equal. Where a white pine and a red birch are crowding each other, I have an an a priori bias. I always cut the birch to favor the pine. Why? Well, first of all, I planted the pine with my shovel, whereas the birch crawled in under the fence and planted itself. My bias is thus that some ex ex extent paternal, but this cannot be the whole story. For if the pine were a natural seedling like the birch, I would value it even more. So I must dig deeper for the logic, if any, behind my bias. So he's wrestling now with like, why does he like pine more than he likes birch? And why is he cutting the birches to help the pines grow? Reason number one, he's planting pines where the birches are growing on their own. The birch is an abundant tree in my township and becoming more so, whereas pine is scarce and becoming scarcer. Perhaps my bias is for the underdog. But what would I do if my farm were further north, where pine is abundant and red birch is scarce? I confess I don't know. My farm is here. So reason two is that there's lots of birch and not much pine. That's why he prefers the pine. The pine will live for a century, the birch for half that. Do I fear that my signature will fade? My neighbors have planted no pines, but all have many birches. Am I snobbish about having a woodlot of distinction? The pine stays green all winter. The birch punches the clock in October. Do I favor the tree that, like myself, braves the winter wind? The pine will shelter a grouse, but the birch will feed him. Do I consider bed more important than board? The pine will ultimately bring $10 a thousand. The birch, $2. Have I an eye on the bank? All of these possible reasons for my bias seem to carry some weight, but none of them carries very much. So he lays out a bunch of differences there, right? He talks about, um, you know, does he want his woodlot to be special compared to the people around him? Does he like the ones that stay green all winter and don't shed their leaves like the pine? Um, does he like the, the, the pines that they produce shelter for his grouse rather than the birches that provide food? You know, there's all kinds of reasons he's laying out there differences between pine and birch. 
So I try again, and here perhaps is something. Under this pine will ultimately grow a trailing arbutus, an Indian pipe, a pyrola, or a twin flower, whereas under the birch a bottle gentian is about the best to be hoped for. In this pine, a pileated woodpecker will ultimately chisel out a nest. In the, bir in the birch, a hairy will have to suffice. A pileated woodpecker is the largest woodpecker in North America, and they love to burrow big giant holes in pine trees, not only to feed, but also to nest. And hairy woodpeckers are tiny little guys that would tend to utilize a birch tree. That's what he's getting at there. In this pine, the wind will sing for me in April, at which time the birch is only rattling naked twigs. These possible reasons for my bias carry weight, but why? Does the pine stimulate my imagination and my hopes more deeply than the birch does? If so, is the difference in the trees or in me? The only conclusion I have ever reached is that I love all trees, but I am in love with pines. As I said, November is the month for the ax, and as in other love affairs, there is skill in the exercise of bias. If the birch stands south of the pine and is taller, it will shade the pine's leader in the spring and thus discourage the pine weevil from laying her eggs there. Birch competition is a minor affliction compared with the weevil, whose progeny kill the pine's leader and thus deform the tree. It is interesting to me meditate that this insect's preference for squatting in the sun determines not only her own continuity as a species, but also the future figure of my pine and my own success as a wielder of axe and shovel. So he's talking about a little bug, the pine weevil, that kills the tip of a pine tree and changes its shape forever. Again, if a droughty summer follows my removal of the birch's shade, the hotter soil may offset the lesser competition for water and my pine be none the better for my bias. Lastly, if the birch's limbs rub the pine's terminal buds during a, wind, during a wind, the pine will surely be deformed and the birch must either be removed regardless of other considerations or else it must be pruned of limbs each winter to a height greater than the pine's prospective summer growth. Such are the pros and cons in the wielder of the nax must foresee, compare and decide upon with the calm assurance that his bias will, on the average, prove to be something more than good intentions. The wielder of an axe has as many biases as there are species of trees on his farm. In the course of the years, he imputes to each species from his responses to their beauty or utility and their responses to his labors for or against them, a series of attributes that constitute a character. I am amazed to learn what diverse characters different men impute to one and the same tree. Thus to me the aspen is in good repute because he glorifies October and he feeds my grouse in winter, but to some of my neighbors he is a mere weed, perhaps because he sprouted so vigorously in the stump lots their grandfathers were attempting to clear. I cannot sneer at this, for I find myself disliking the elms whose re-sprouting threatens my prines. Again, the tamarack is to me a favorite, second only to white pine, perhaps because he is nearly extinct in my township, or because he sprinkles gold on October grouse or because he sours the soil and enables it to grow the loveliest of our orchids, the showy lady slipper. On the other hand, foresters have excommunicated the tamarack because he grows too slowly to pay compound interest. In order to clinch this dispute, they also mention that he succumbs periodically to episodics of sawfly. But this is 50 years hence for my tamaracks, so I shall let my grandson worry about it. Meanwhile, my tamaracks are growing so lustily that my spirits soar with them skyward. To me, an ancient cottonwood is the greatest of trees because in his youth he shaded the buffalo and wore a halo of pigeons. And I like a young cottonwood because he may someday, someday become ancient. But the farmer's wife, and hence the farmer, despises all cottonwoods because in June, the female tree clogs the screens with cotton. The modern dogma is comfort at any cost. So he's going over there over and over again, all these different species of trees, why some people love them, why some people hate them. Each tree has its own uh, pros and cons to people. I find my biases more numerous than those of my neighbors because I have individual likings for many species that they lump under one aspersive category, brush. Thus, I like the wahoo, partly because deer, rabbits, and mice are so avid to eat his square twigs and green bark, and partly because he, his... Ceres berries glow so warmly against November snow. I like the red dogwood because he feeds October robins and the prickly ash because my woodcock take their daily sun bath under the shelter of his thorns. I like the hazel because his October purple feeds my eye and because November catkins feed my deer and grouse. I like the bittersweet because my father did and because the deer on the 1st of July of each year begins suddenly to eat the new leaves and I have learned to protect this event to my guests. I cannot dislike a plant that enables me, a mere professor, to blossom forth annually as a successful seer and prophet. 
It is evident that our planet biases are in part traditional. If your grandfather liked hickory nuts, you will like hickory tree because your father told you to. You know, if, on the other hand, your grandfather burned a log carrying a poison ivy vine and recklessly stood in the smoke, you will dislike the species, no matter with what crimson glories it warms your eyes each fall. It is also evident that our plant biases reflect not only vocations, but avocations with a delicate allocation of priority as between industry and indolence. The farmer, who would rather hunt grouse than milk cows, will not dislike hawthorn, no matter if it does invade his pasture. The coon hunter will not dislike basswood, and I know of quail hunters who bear no grudge against ragweed, despite their annual bout with hay fever. Our biases are indeed a sensitive index to our affections, our tastes, our loyalties, our generosities, and our manner of wasting weekends. Be that as it may, I am content to waste mine in November with axe in hand. I love that line at the end there. Our biases are indeed a sensitive index to our affections, our tastes, our loyalties, our generosities, and our manner of wasting weekends. I'll tell you what, everybody has their own manner of wasting weekends. And uh, that, you know, what he's getting at there is your hobby. What do you like to do? And how does that affect which trees you like the most? That's kind of what he's, what he's getting at there. So now time to do a little bit of reflection here. We're going we're gonna to write up a little Collins Type 3 response Three to five sentences can get the job done here. More I would love to read. Um, but you're going to do three things for me. Number one, you're going to identify three differences between pine and birch that Leopold lays out. And there are way more than three. I even stopped and mentioned a couple of them for you. Then you're going to just identify one passage that relates to your own observations in Maine. Are there any of those species you mentioned there? You, it could be as simple as one of those species he mentions in your yard or, you know, is there a species you like more than others for, and for what reason? How do, you, how do you relate to this story? And finally, at the bottom of the second page, that quote, our biases are indeed a sensitive index to our affections, our tastes, our loyalties, our generosities, and our manner of wasting weekends. What I'm looking for you to do is based upon that quote, what's your manner of wasting weekends and what is your most or least favorite tree because of it? So you may have a tree that you really, really like because of your hobby, or you may have a tree that you really, really dislike because of your hobby, right? Like, a, you know, you know, for example, rake in the yard is no fun. Is there a certain type of tree in your yard that drops tons of leaves that you end up having to rake? And um, maybe, maybe that's a tree you dislike because of your manner of wasting weekends raking away. Um, just an idea, but there's all kinds of things you can do with that. Um, do your best on it. Give me some honest reflection. I love reading this stuff and I look forward to seeing your work. And I thank you a bunch for tuning in and we'll see you next time.